What is beauty, mathematically speaking? Beauty means that a particular specimen closely resembles the original prototype. Let us imagine that the maximum and minimum dimensions of all body parts were put into a computer. Length of nose, 3 to 7 centimeters. Height of forehead, 3 to 8 centimeters, and so on. Ugliness is the poetic capriciousness of coincidence. Beauty is the unpoetic average. Beauty, more than ugliness, reveals the non-individuality, the impersonality of a face. That's what Milan Kundera writes about beauty and ugliness in his book Immortality. Now, symmetry is usually linked to what we consider beautiful. And despite the author's attempts to define an asymmetrical face as something poetically random, full of individuality and character, although ugly, that still hasn't helped humanity redefine beauty or ugliness. It just makes of a good quote. Famously, the brilliant mathematician Pythagoras developed the golden ratio, a geometrical formula that linked balance and symmetry to beauty. And not just amongst humans, but in everything. According to this ratio, symmetrical faces are the most beautiful. In fact, ancient Greeks believed that physical beauty had a direct correlation with internal beauty, meaning that good-looking people were also morally good, while those deemed ugly were lacking character. What a lot of bull. We know now that that's as far from the truth as possible. We know it when we think about it logically, but in that split second when you're looking into a beautiful face, you usually tend to attribute many positive qualities to the owner of the face, qualities that have nothing to do with looks. Now, beauty standards are culturally fluid, if this term exists. There is a tribe in Tanzania, for example, where the women remove one of their front teeth because this apparently makes them look more beautiful and attractive. Beauty means different things in different parts of the world, but despite the fact that our idea of beauty is guided by cultural influences, the Western beauty standards are more or less imposing their norms, as they always did. There are entire studies about this phenomenon, and as one article puts it, beauty is in the eye of the colonizer. And the colonizer who conquers and reigns and rules always imposes his social norms, his political system, his religious beliefs and his beauty standards. Given that in a way we have conquered dogs, we have imposed our beauty standards on them too. Beauty standards that make no sense to dogs, but they do to us. And it's not just about plain beauty, otherwise things would be a bit simpler. It's also about the various things we have set dog features to symbolize. Strength, loyalty, cuteness, family life, outdoors, indoors, couch potato, fitness, status, money, fashion, out of fashion. And the thing is that shelters, especially in countries like Greece, where 90% of the rescues are mixed breed dogs, products of natural selection and not eugenics, I mean factory production, I'm sorry, I mean selective breeding, <laughs> excuse me. What was I saying? Yes, most dogs here are products of natural selection, so they actually generally look just like dogs. And that's not very appealing. A huge percentage of dogs in shelters are well, they are as dogs would be if we just stopped interfering with their breeding. And those are the dogs that are stuck in the shelters for years and years. Dogs like him. This is Elias. He was rescued in Greece and he spent more than six years in the shelter. That's 2,190 days, 52,560 hours, 3,153,600 minutes. Elias is an average-looking dog. Very average, I suppose. Average color, average patterns, average fur. Not long and fluffy, not short and shiny. Average ears, not too long, not too pointy, not floppy, not cropped. Average size, average everything, basically. You can't really see any breeds in him. You can't relate to anything when it comes to him. 
People have learned to make connections in their brains between breeds and qualities they think are related to those breeds. Even if most of us know basically nothing about dog breeds, putting a brand name to a dog helps make a connection with something pretty vague, but still, this connection is there and it brings familiarity into the relationship from the get-go. The familiarity of listening to the name of a breed and of repeating it, a name that we've heard before, that we can Google, that we can mention in a conversation, helps us falsely relate. We like tags because they make everything easier. We even try to put tags to the mixed breeds. Here, <laughs> anything that is beige and over 25 kilos is a Labrador mix. Anything that is white with black spots, short haired and floppy ears is a Dalmatian mix. Anything that is black and tan with a furry tail is a German Shepherd mix and so on. Elias is a dog that cannot fit under any tag. He looks like mm, nothing, really. And as for his beauty, well, beauty is complicated with dogs. It's not just about the symmetry, it's about what the features we see in a dog mean to us what we have connected them with, what we have been told they symbolize, even if we don't realize we have been told anything. You know, I was talking to a friend of a friend about a month ago. At some point I told her that, well, I complained, that most beautiful dogs in shelters always get adopted first. She said, yes, I imagine that's true, but I understand it. If I were to adopt, I would adopt a beautiful dog. But you see, what is considered beautiful in a dog has to do with norms and standards that have been more or less imposed, not forcibly, of course, but culturally. And business-wise, <laughs> it's the same with humans. A woman with a missing front tooth would not be considered pretty here, but she would be in that part in Tanzania. The stereotypes are there in our brains, so are the culturally imposed norms about what is beautiful and what isn't. So even when we think we are free to decide which dog to adopt based on what we like, this freedom is not much of a freedom, really. And to be honest, we still haven't shaken off that belief that dates back to ancient Greece about how external beauty is linked to internal beauty. We might not consciously believe that this is the case, but subconsciously, while scrolling through photos of dogs available for adoption, our brains fail to imagine how a cute fluffy white dog can be aggressive and mean, or how a huge fierce looking sheepdog with cropped ears and a cropped tail could be mellow and submissive. So Elias spent more than six years behind bars, paying the price for a crime he had no idea he was guilty of. We tried and tried and tried to get people to see him, to just take a look. But this is a face you don't look twice at. This is a face you scroll through. And no matter how much we tried, Elias kept being invisible. And while the dogs around him would get adopted over the years, he would remain stuck there in that shelter year after year after year after year. That was frustrating. For me, it was the most frustrating thing of all, not just because of the unfairness of it, but because Elias was the most needy dog I knew. The most needy for attention, the most needy for some kind of human interaction, for some new experience, for something different. He would jump at you once you let him loose and run around and jump again and go here and there and roll over and would not stand still for one second. It's as if he was trying in that one hour of quality time he was given to do everything. Because you can't satisfy years of thirst with a drop of water. And he had been so thirsty that nothing would satisfy him. Nothing would get him tired enough so that he would lay down for just one second. Even stand still. And the even more heartbreaking thing of all was not the fact that he was needy, but the fact that after so many years he had been institutionalized to the point where this institutionalization was proving to be more powerful than his need to break free. And every time he would be let loose, instead of running free, he would run to his kennel and wait for someone to open the door so that he would get back in there. 
I'm so sad. For everything I've mentioned so far, Elias became one of the most non-adoptable dogs ever. For his looks, for his mixed breed face, for his age, for his behavior. Most people who met him must have had the same thought. Bring him home and watch him tear it down without even standing still for one second. <laughs> For me, this dog represented everything we have been doing wrong with dogs. Every single erroneous thought we have when it comes to choosing a companion dog, a pet. When we choose someone that basically we expect will love us back. But just like with arranged marriages, the love us back part is the last thing on the matchmaker's mind. The first things are things that have nothing to do with love has to do with looks, with status, with money, with a good job, with a dowry possibility, or the lack of it. That's why arranged marriages failed. And when we started finding our partners on our own, we started focusing on love. And we need to start doing the same thing with dogs. A few of these thoughts, which I know might sound a bit annoying to some, I did express them in another video about Elias a year ago. And it was meant to be the video that got him adopted. The video was titled Ugly, sort of clickbait, but I did explain how Elias' looks were preventing him from being adopted. I was surprised at the comments, to be honest. He's not ugly, he's beautiful. Why would you call him ugly? He's a beautiful dog. If only I could adopt him. All I see is a beautiful dog. Uh, <laughs> I, I understand that most of the people commenting meant well. But meaning well sometimes doesn't really help face an issue that is very much there. It only helps sweep it under the carpet. Pretend it doesn't exist. Because the fact is that Elias is not a good-looking dog. He's not a bad-looking dog either. He's just a plain dog. And the truth also is that he spent year after year in the shelter mainly because of that. Calling him ugly or average or plain in a video addressing the issue of non-adoptable mixed-breed plain-looking dogs was not meant to be divisive. All I was attempting was to draw attention to divisions that already exist. The plethora of comments insisting how I don't know what I'm talking about and how Elias is a beautiful dog had me thinking, why would so many people react this way? Why would they try so hard to overcompensate for something? And I think I realized that this reaction was mainly because the issue of the appearance of someone we love is an issue we want to shake off completely, but we're not able to yet. And that frustration manifests in comments like, you don't know what you're talking about, he's a fine looking dog. Because we have no other way of handling it. We don't just want to say beauty is only skin deep, because that's not enough. That would mean that the dog is not that beautiful really, but he has a kind heart and is worthy of love, etc. But that's not enough. What we want is to redefine beauty, to reinvent it. And calling average looking dogs beautiful is an effort to do exactly that, to redefine beauty standards for dogs, or to abolish them completely. Eventually, that video got Elias adopted. The organization received dozens of emails, and if any of the people who emailed and asked to adopt him are watching this right now, I would like to thank you. All this attention became sort of a light-hearted joke among the volunteers. We were picturing strangers from all over the world wanting to adopt Elias and save him from the bad people who were caring for him, calling him ugly. <laughs> but no rescuer ever sees any animal as ugly. What rescuers see very early on in a dog that is recovering is society's idea of that dog who is about to be put up for adoption. And that's when the anxiety starts, because most of us know that for many of those dogs, adoption will be a long process. Anyway, it's been months since Elias moved to his forever home. The weirdest thing is that it's as if he always belonged there. It's funny how dogs that seem to not be able to adjust to a shelter life adjust perfectly in a home. 
how they move around all happy and confident, how they change, how they look healthier, younger, happier. A home brings out the individuality in every dog, an individuality that you struggle to see when they're amongst so many others. His family says that he is a perfect dog. <laughs> How about that? Elias, a perfect dog. It took six long years for that, for him to have a chance to be a perfect dog. In a way that's sad. And even though he didn't know what he was missing, he would spend day after day in the shelter, the fact that he never really settled there means that he was missing something. He just didn't know what. Sometimes I ask to see photos of him sleeping. Six years and I had never seen that dog sleep. Relax. Never. It was as if he was in a constant effort to get somewhere, as if he had a goal he could never reach. And he kept trying and trying. Oh, he doesn't have to try anymore. So he sleeps. Maybe his goal was actually to redefine beauty. He had no other way of doing that but sitting in the shelter day after day, night after night, being agitated. And his agitation and his frustration was there for us to translate it to what it really meant. You know, his family says that he is the best dog anyone could ever hope for. <laughs> when I visited them a few months ago, his mom mentioned something I could not quite interpret back then, but I can now. She said that Elias is the most beautiful dog in the world because he teaches them every single day about love, about devotion and about gratitude. There you go. What I've been trying to say for the last 20 minutes or so, she said it in one sentence. Beauty is not in the color of the fur or the length of the ears or in pedigree credentials and breed standards. Beauty is love. So there you go, beauty redefined. <laughs> I guess Elias managed to get his message through after all. Good things come to those who wait. So does love. I suppose, and in fact, so does beauty.